love those scratches. Star Wars Battlefront Renegade Squadron is... awesome? Wait, what? Releasing in 2007, two years after the acclaimed Battlefront sequel, Renegade Squadron was exclusive to the PlayStation Portable, Sony's first attempt at breaking into the handheld market, and sadly, the game technically still is exclusive to the PSP. I have no idea how Konami of all companies had the foresight to port their PSP game to consoles, but not LucasArts, but whatever. If you want to play this game, you better get a frickin' PlayStation Portable, I guess. Hopefully this changes soon, and Sony adds it to their PSP Classics catalog for everyone to enjoy. It's surprisingly solid, absolutely worth a few afternoons of playing through the campaign and diving into the Galactic Conquest mode. There's some new maps, a new game mode, a different take on Galactic Conquest, more weapons, a lot of customization options, and some new heroes. Heck, IG-88 is even here! How can you say no to this goofy guy? In all seriousness, I'm actually shocked this game is as good as it is. Not because the random British development team Rebellion nailed the look and feel of the classic games, but more so that it plays as well as it does considering the controller differences. Without the right thumbstick, how could one even play this third-person shooter? Well, the answer is as simple as it is surprisingly fitting. Auto-aim is pretty standard for console shooters, but here it's a mechanic. Remember the targeting function from Battlefront 2? It's basically a more advanced version of that. You hold down R, your reticle snaps onto someone, and the smaller the circle, the better your accuracy. X, or the bottom face button, is how you shoot, so you'll be holding R to lock on, and then holding X to fire. It's a bit tricky at the start, especially with weapons that you charge up, since you have to hold X to keep your gun charged while unpressing and repressing R to target the proper enemy, but you start to gel with it pretty quickly. It becomes second nature after an hour or two. Rolling undoes your lock-on, so you'll often see enemy units dodging the moment you start shooting, which causes the circle to refocus again. If there aren't any targets nearby and you hold R, you'll strafe while looking straight ahead, whereas otherwise, pressing left or right turns you left or right. Tank controls. Oh, how so many people seem to hate tank controls. Even though I'm able to slide back into them without much hassle, for a game as fast-paced as this, I do think it makes things a bit tedious at times. Turning around is already quite the process, but fighting in corners and cramped areas is a nightmare, genuinely. Besides that, sometimes you'll target the wrong person, or... a uh, turret, and that can get annoying, but... All in all, for what Renegade Squadron has to work with to exist on this handheld device in the first place, it could have been a lot worse. Really, for me, the worst part about the lack of the right stick isn't turning or tight spaces, it's having to rely on the game to move your camera when on slopes. It naturally points you forward, and until you're on the part of the floor that's descending or ascending, you'll continue to keep looking forward. If there's someone in your auto-aim range, it'll thankfully look down at them, but if they're too far away or behind a wall or something, Welp, going downstairs is basically a crapshoot, might as well jump down. The gentle curves of bridges and ramps aren't quite as egregious, but it can still impede your approach enough to cause troubles. This is where first-person view can come in handy. Pressing triangle will zoom in with your weapon, sometimes twice depending on the gun, and while it is a bit sensitive to aim with, when elevation differences are a factor, it helps to get clear shots off in a pinch. Interestingly, some weapons flat out won't target certain units on the battlefield. I can kind of understand this, since it's trying to encourage a style of play for these guns. Rocket launchers can only target vehicles, not soldiers, and sniper rifles just can't target at all. The problem is, that's your main method of replacing the right control stick, so when a straggler gets a little too close for comfort, taking them out with a rocket or sniper shot, something you could manage to do just fine on the PS2 or Xbox, is a daunting task. This does go some way to encourage a balanced loadout, but I'll get to that a bit later on. Now, if you played this game before and were an expert, you're probably thinking, hey now, all of these observations are meaningless since there's an alternate control scheme available. In it, R is how you fire, and the four face buttons on the right control the camera, same as when you zoom in under the default controls. This places your secondary fire and first person buttons on the D-pad and removes rolling altogether. The trade-off might be worth it though, as now you can better aim your sniper or rocket launcher in tight scenarios up close. I mean, the hitboxes are still really strict and wonky, making the sniper a gamble, but even still, it's better. Best of all, turning around is a breeze compared to the extremely cumbersome stop-and-turn-and-go of the default scheme. I'm happy these alternate controls exist, as more options are almost always a good thing, and maybe for some, this is the ideal way to play, pretending that everything is A-OK, -okay, this controls like a normal shooter game. For me, though, because the AI was already so simple, seemingly programmed to work with the clunkier movement and aiming, sticking with the default scheme felt more comfortable. 
I really don't like controlling the camera with buttons, even as far back as shooters on the N64 I wasn't a fan. The digital nature of it, where one press determines a set distance aimed left or right, feels pretty bad. Plus, throwing grenades or what have you being bound to the D-pad is a bit awkward, and you lose out on rolling entirely. Not that I ever rolled much, but still. If that wasn't enough, the alternate controls don't solve the slopes problem. It auto-corrects itself if you don't keep nursing one of the camera buttons. Yeah, I'll stick to the admittedly basic and straightforward targeting system. I really don't mean to talk down about the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, it's strangely satisfying to lock on to an enemy unit as if you're a starfighter or something, and then go bananas. The enemy units even stop moving at times, standing still for you to get a clearer shot. How nice of them. This doesn't feel all that different from the previous Battlefront games, and in some ways it's a little better. I didn't see my entire team get stuck in a certain spot on Naboo, for instance. I'd say, even though it's a little clunkier to move around, regardless of the control scheme you go with, you more or less feel the Battlefront magic each time you boot up a match. The visuals, at least to my untrained eye, resemble the PS2 chunkiness to a T, and the audio was almost exactly what I expected, the only exception being the pathetic lightsaber strikes. So, all in all, this felt like I was finally getting to experience a true sequel-ish to Battlefront 2. There's even a straight-up improvement over it. Remember me complaining that if you declined to play as the hero, a CPU wouldn't take over the role and your team just wouldn't have one? Well, that's not the case here. You can fight alongside your Jedi and Sith heroes once more. So cool. Even if they can sometimes cost you a win. If you were the final person on your team and you declined the hero, a CPU spawns in with them and... If they die, that's it. It's kind of a lose-lose situation, to be frank. The lightsaber users aren't as good as certain builds are, so if you choose Luke to spare yourself a computer player fucking up with him, you'll have less of a chance to win the day than if you didn't have the hero available at all. This negatively impacts Galactic Conquest the most, but I'll bring this up again once we get there. When you accept the prompt, instead of spawning in at a command post, you'll instantly become the character. The same thing happens in space battles, you'll morph into the new ship. Even though it's more convenient and free-flowing, the visual of it, and the idea itself of a random nobody soldier being taken over by a hero or villain, is a little disturbing. It reminds me of Agents in the Matrix, the original person's agency being tossed aside, their soul being evaporated, all to make way for the incoming Star Wars god. Jesus fuck, I'm freaking myself out, it's just a dumb PSP game, calm down dork. Another improvement, as far as I'm concerned, over Battlefront 2 is the return of the command post names. In the first game, they were all personalized, but in two, they were replaced with numbers. Better for alerting your teammates where they should go? Perhaps, but I'll always appreciate when locations and games have specialized names. The only thing missing here is the list of vehicles at each spawn point. I wonder if the text would have been too small or something? One of the biggest focuses in development for Renegade Squadron was the freedom to customize your character. Gone are the distinct classes with their own strengths and weaknesses, Gone is the score system that allowed you to select the elite units after you did well enough in battle. Instead, you're allotted 100 credits to spend, and quite a few categories to go through. Main weapon, secondary weapon, explosive, special item, power-up, health, speed, and capture rate. Everything is priced in a way to hopefully keep things balanced. For instance, you won't be able to have health, speed, and capture rate all the way up while also using really strong guns. On the whole, this customization system, while worrying at a glance, is fucking great. There are so many fun builds to experiment with and pull out for certain situations, especially when playing the campaign mode or capture the flag. It was a joy to mix and match, discover a great setup, and keep that in your back pocket for later. For instance, speed level 3, plus the stamina buff and stealth kit, is stellar for capture the flag, as you can sneak into their base, grab the golden ticket, and then run home as fast as you can. It was also interesting to be able to swap over to something else on the fly, essentially, when near a command post. Talk about finding the right tools for the right situations, you can literally panic, have a pause break, change your entire loadout, and then heal or take out the encroaching forces. With all of the many, many options available, you'd think there would have to be some overpowered builds, right? Well, not as many as you might think. Balance was a big worry for the development team when it came to this system, but after a lot of playtesting, this is what they ended up shipping out, as they were happy with the lack of cheesy setups. I'd say, going off my time with the game, nothing stands out as being too cheap or expensive, save for one gun in particular. The chain gun. It is the most expensive option out there, 40 credits, 
but you can still pair it with the full speed at 30 and full health at 30 for an even 100. This setup is a wrecking ball, truly. I don't know how well it handles when facing off against real players, but for AI opposition, they don't stand a chance. Unless they have a fucking shield, in which case they get to stay alive a bit longer while I curse them out under my breath. Goddamn motherfucker. I'd also say the ammo and health replenishment packs are a bit on the cheaper side, but I can see how Rebellion tried to lessen its solo potential. You throw them out really far ahead of you, so you'll have to risk running at the enemy, or even them grabbing it instead of you when in tight situations. After a while, you'll learn to toss it against a wall to keep it close by, but hey, they tried to balance it, I guess. There's also a noticeable delay when swapping weapons or finishing a reload. Utilizing a homing rocket launcher as a secondary weapon is truly fantastic. I love using it when spotting a cluster of clueless goobers, or even to snag a tricky maneuverable enemy in the clutch at short notice, but it takes a long time to reload, isn't an automatic thing, meaning you'll have to press the fire button to start the process, and you can't do that until the rocket explodes. Accidentally prepping for a new rocket might seal the deal when trying to escape from a group of enemies, as you won't be able to swap over to a new gun, nor throw out any items, like health packs, until you're done with the animation. Curse my desire to multitask. Also, there isn't a dedicated reload button, by the way. You have to empty your entire clip and then press fire to reload. Isn't a huge deal for me, since I have played Earth Defense Force 2017, but still, it's a thing people are used to, so I'm sure it annoyed some people. The buffs and stat increases are fun, but the one that really stands out is the capture rate. Sure, running around with a chain gun or incinerator to fuck everyone up with high health and other equipment is great, and a decent method to thin the numbers in Conquest, but you could also sneak in and steal, or sprint and overtake, their command posts lightning quick. Without the capture rate increases, the transition is about as slow as you expect, but with the third tier equipped, it's like having an entire army with you. It's four times as fast. It's insane. The pricing for this one specifically is great, starting at 15 and going up to 35. This means even if you go the route of domination via chain gun, you can't have full speed or full health plus the full capture rate, let alone any other equipment that could offer assistance. When speaking on the weapons as a whole for Renegade Squadron, there's one or two new things, and aside from the time bomb, basically everything from Battlefront 2 made its way in. Initially, I thought the Bothan Spy's primary gun was absent, until I remembered it was called the Incinerator for some reason. In name only, that has made a return, but now it's actually fire that shoots out of it. The Carbonite gun, though, is the real shiny new toy. I can't say I found it particularly useful, but I can definitely see how it could be excellent with other players. It freezes enemy soldiers in place, the length of time being determined by how long you charge it up. I tried pairing it with certain grenades and the try shot, but swapping over to them ate some time already, and you can basically get one hit in before they start moving again. I feel like this would go hand in hand with a teammate sniper, but I'll never know for sure. Supposedly, it's decent for freezing flag holders and capture the flag, but the shot itself is so precise, like a sniper bullet, that I found it too difficult to reliably connect with the target of my choosing. A neat idea, but I don't think it thrives against AI, especially with some of the other guns out there you'll be going without. Hold on just a second there, past Dork Axe. This is future, uh, Dork at Law. I'm a lawyer, or something. We're lawyers! I've come to find quite a few pieces of evidence you omitted in your Carbonite Gun Slander session. Exhibit A, the Explosive Blaster Pistol. Yes, it still takes a while to swap over, and the gun itself fires so fast it doesn't really need much assistance, but it absolutely can be a good combo to go with. That's nothing compared to this next one. Exhibit B, the Cluster Grenades. This firmly cements the Carbonite gun as a viable primary weapon, and one of the better one-two punches in the game. Seriously, this thing wrecks the opposition. Even Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader's brother of course, didn't stand a chance. I rest my case, past Dork Axe. You are wrong, and you should feel bad. The Cluster Grenade makes its first Battlefront appearance here, too. Toss it and... Wait, isn't this from that one commercial? Is a tight one in here? No. I mean, not the Renegade Squadron commercial anyway, but it was in some PSP advertisement. I just can't make out the game. Drop a Cluster Bomb. Cluster Bomb. Smash the tree. No, 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 no. Cluster Bombs! Cluster Bomb! Ratchet and Clank, maybe? Anyway, the Cluster Bomb is fine. It splits into a few explosives. Another brand new addition, one exclusive to the PSP Battlefront games apparently, is the Explosive Blaster Pistol. It's one shot per reload, has a good bit of range and speed, and deals enough damage to take out enemies in one shot depending on their max health. It also has splash damage, making it a nice selection all around. As far as returning equipment, the Arc Caster is a high-priced 30 credits, but sincerely, I don't understand how to make it effective. 
My friend was able to make the most out of the Dark Trooper on Battlefront 2, getting it to chain and kill a group pretty well, but here I just can't find the sweet spot. Maybe it's the new targeting system throwing me off? Feels too expensive for how little I can get out of it. While the homing rocket is a secondary gun, the dumb rocket launcher is in the primary category. Its strength can really be felt against vehicles, and it being 25 is a bargain in tight spots. Bowcaster feels decent, as does the shotgun and blaster rifle, with the latter costing 25 credits. Interesting how the base gun for the starting class in the previous games is worth a quarter of your total credit allowance. Given that thermal detonators and the non-reduced speed and health tier 1 selections are all worth 10, 55 credits equals a standard soldier from the PS2 game, so it's not that bad. You can truthfully get a lot more here even when you cosplay as a previous Battlefront unit, so maybe 25 for the blaster rifle isn't so terrible. The fusion cutter is still here and can repair droids and turrets and whatnot, but even more, you can still slice into and steal a vehicle. I really didn't think this would make the transition, but you love to see it. There's a sniper rifle like Orbital Strike, which is surprisingly finicky and unsatisfying. However, I did manage to get it to work as Akbar in a building. Actually, I got it to work in another building as a regular unit. I don't know why this is happening, but hey, pretty sick. Recon droid, personal shield, auto turret helper, dead packs, watch those wrist rockets. The default control scheme's targeting system actually has an unintended knock-on effect when it comes to the wrist rockets specifically. If your currently equipped gun isn't one that you're able to lock onto soldiers with, like a rocket launcher, your wrist rockets can't lock on either. You only get that benefit when currently equipping a weapon that has the lock-on ability. For instance, I gain it back when I swap over to the explosive blaster pistol, a secondary gun. Very strange. There's the jetpack and jump pack variants, but no special item has as much utility as the stealth kit. I've already mentioned it in relation to Capture the Flag, but it especially comes in handy during the campaign mode, given the many objectives you'll need to grab or destroy behind enemy lines. The passive vehicle regen buff, the one that was so tedious to unlock in Battlefront 2 due to the legendary 64 medal requirement, is available here for only 10 credits. Sick. This comes in handy with space battles naturally, but I'm a dummy and kept forgetting to use it for the majority of my playtime. Sick. The space combat is decent, albeit a bit clunky compared to the normal gameplay. R isn't target, that's the button to go faster, and L is to go slower, meaning now locking on is assigned to the D-pad. Up or down, I don't remember which, I always got them confused, and that actually got me in trouble once. D-pad up, I think, is auto-dock, taking control away from you to land your ship in the nearest hangar. This doesn't always go as planned. Yeah, I don't know what happened there, but ever since that incident, I make sure to always shove my starfighter into the hole manually. Initially, the constant barrage of homing missiles was really annoying, but once I learned dodging when it gets to 100 meters away will always save you from taking damage, it wasn't so bad. Also, yes, if you want to do a 180, you can do a flippy move, something I missed when discussing Battlefront 2. Sadly, there aren't as many options for sabotage in Renegade Squadron. Sometimes one of the doors is open, but I think that's exclusive to the home base defenses for Galactic Conquest matches. Where in Battlefront 2, you could destroy their engine cooling tanks, life support system, auto turret defense mainframe, and shield generator from the inside. You can't do any of that this time, except the shield and that one exception I mentioned. All of the doors are closed, meaning unless you wanted to either camp out and slay soldiers or steal one of their ships, infiltration trips are pretty pointless. Kinda sad. To their credit, Rebellion did add in a few vehicles. For the Empire in space, there's the TIE Defender, the triangle-looking weirdo, and for the Rebels, there's the B-Wing, Akbar's specialty ship, so says the wiki page I looked up. A couple of ground vehicles were added, but they kind of blend into the background and aren't especially interesting. The only thing of note is the restrictive controls in relation to the ATST. It aims down all the time, so you can't shoot anybody that isn't directly on the ground in front of you. Besides the gameplay customization, you can also personalize your soldier's appearance. Each faction has a handful of body types, which grants you a few heads to pick from. God, that sounds so weird. You can choose the colors too, which also seems to determine the look of your teammates. I'm not sure if this was the case when online, but offline, it's kind of fun to pick your army's color. Seeing an entire droid battalion painted black is quite the sight. None of this affects gameplay, only the equipment determines your stats. So Wookiees, for instance, aren't tougher than Bothans. I do think the droids being so twiggy and tiny makes them harder to shoot, but that was the case for the previous games, so it is what it is. 
Many of the maps came back from Battlefront 2, but there's a handful of new ones as well. Baz Pity, a planet offhandedly mentioned in Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, So look, Amaya has fallen, and Master Voss has moved his troops to Baz Pity. Is a battle space here, and it fucking sucks. They placed an AT-AT -AT here, but it can only walk a certain distance or something. Because it's so beefy strong, and there aren't any alternative routes, it can just sit there and block a portion of the map off, unless you stealth or ride the knockoff Wampa to the back command post. Such a weird fucking map, one of the most one-dimensional in the series. It's like they tried to do another Hoth, but missed out on the part that Hoth was a very open area with some tunnels that connected a couple command posts. Unless I'm missing something, this is a slightly curvy, linear stretch of barren nothing. Even Battlefront 2 Geonosis is better than this. Okay, let's not get ahead of myself here. Maybe it's not that bad. Ord Mantel? Ord Mantle? Ah, oh, fuck, I'm gonna get roasted in the comments. Feels like a mix between Geonosis and Tatooine. It gives off off-brand Mos Eisley vibes, but it is one of my favorites. I like the piles of junk used to divide up the play space, and the vacant command post at the start in the lone pool of water. Even though the colors here are more on the bland side of things at a glance, it has a charm to it. There's enough gray and black specks intermixed that make it strangely comfy. Korriban? Korriban? Ah, oh, fuck. One of the planets from the Old Republic games made the cut. It's a Sith temple, so it has stone architecture and a red color to everything. There's even red carpeting, truly the sign of absolute evil. At a glance, it looks more interesting than it really is. The tactical maps the game gives you aren't really that helpful or accurate, but it sure does look like Korriban loops around on itself, providing the player a full circle, but it doesn't. It's closed off. Why that extra corner piece is there is beyond me, but it's kinda lame, and this map feels very paint-by-numbers because of it. Solist, while in Battlefront 2015, is new for Renegade Squadron, and is completely different from its future self. Whereas that one is a straight line and is mostly black, with some magma now and then, this one is... green. And glowy. This and Seilukami are the two that make this feel like a mod game at times. Bright colors, unfamiliar areas, without much resembling Star Wars at a glance. Seilukami even has palm trees. It's wild. Aside from the novelty of being a new map, neither are particularly interesting, besides their hero selection. Asajj Ventress can be found on both, Seilukami has Admiral Akbar, and Solist has Kit Fisto and IG-88. Hell yeah. Among the handful of returning maps, most have either been tweaked or scaled back a bit. The stairs outside in Mustafar, for instance, don't lead anywhere, it's a dead end. Also, the bridge gimmick is gone, the controls don't work. Sad. Surprisingly, Hoth is still as you might expect, there's just a layer of fog all over, and only one AT-AT. You can still take it down with the snow speeder, awesomely enough, but it's a bit too simple this time around. Press square, it attaches 100% of the time, and while you're going around, you literally can't angle your ship upwards or downwards, there's no chance to mess up. Still cool, though. You can't pilot the AT-AT -AT as the Empire, it just skirts along a set path and does its own thing. Alright, I guess. Endor feels pretty different, and this time for the better. You know I don't love forest maps, but having a command post centered around a downed AT-AT -AT is really cool. Kashyyyk doesn't have the big back area behind the wall, the map just kinda ends after you walk in. Yavin 4 doesn't have its back area either, the bridge is collapsed, making the play space a bit more cramped. Naboo, Mos Eisley, and Geonosis are all a bit smaller too. Considering that the game has half as many units at a time, 16 versus 32, it makes sense for all of these environments to match the reduced soldier count. The only game mode that didn't make a return this time is Hero Assault. You know, the one that has all the gods of Star Wars banging on each other. It's banging and banging and banging. When a guy's banging you... Conquest is the default game mode and play is how you'd expect. Both variations of Capture the Flag are here, but interestingly enough, Renegade Squadron added a new game mode, Hero Capture the Flag. This is genuinely really fun. You know how much I like seeing AI heroes roam around, and this is that, but all the time, if you want anyway. Instead of the flags occupying a certain space on the battlefield, once a soldier grabs their own flag, they become the hero. There's a degree of risk versus reward here, since obviously heroes are strong and can help in battle, but being out and about, instead of hiding away taking shelter, puts you at risk of getting ganged up on, losing your flag, and costing your team a point. Honestly, even if that fun dilemma wasn't present, choosing to let your AI guy take the flag and watch the Titans duke it out? Oh god, it's such a blast. The heroes themselves, though, are a pretty mixed bag. I like the new additions, Asajj Ventress from Clone Wars, IG-88, My Liege, Admiral Akbar and his serial, and Kit Fisto and his Kicks of Destruction. 
There's even Ben Kenobi. Hey, look at that, you fucking idiots, Dice. You see? You see? Ben Kenobi! What did I tell ya? Uh, anyway, like I was saying, the heroes are a mixed bag. The gun-wielding boys and girls and droids? Sure, not bad. But the lightsaber swings for all of the Sith and Jedi are so pathetic, it turns them into a joke. When fighting them, you can just keep backing up and firing away. Obi-Wan stands no chance. The reach on their lightsaber swings are laughably tiny, and if the enemies didn't stop and wait now and then, normal strikes simply wouldn't ever work. The lock on targeting doesn't help much either. When you finally get close enough, it angles downwards, showcasing just how in their ass you need to be for damage to be done. Literally, your character model needs to fuse with the enemy to make contact. Not that you'd ever know, unless you're watching their health bar, the audio for the lightsaber attacks are less than limp. It's a negative sound. It sucks air from your room into the speakers. Truly terrible stuff, but hey, force powers. Just look at that goofy and stilted lightsaber throw. Oh god. Grievous is an option, but only shows up on Maigito and Tatooine, which are... interesting choices, I guess. No Utapau in this game, so sure, throw him in most Eisley. I've been told, time and time again in the comments, that his dash attack is great in Battlefront 2, which is something I forgot to mention, so I apologize, and to make up for it, I'll showcase his phenomenal dash attack in this game. Oh right, it's dog shit. For some reason, all the dash attacks are putrid in Renegade Squadron. They don't land where you'd expect them to, they slow you down to a crawl, and their animations are goofy. A stab? Really? The only one that I liked was Kit Fisto's. Fucker has a shotgun for a foot, he destroys droids the moment he touches them. What a perfect way to end a game. Sadly, this didn't work as well on vehicles. Welp, I guess I can confirm running heroes over is still a viable strategy. Actually, running over people is just plain good in and of itself. Wholesome fun for the family. Speaking of dashing, Vader's sprint is hilarious. What the fuck, he just glides at Mach 10 across the battlefield. Now, I know what you're thinking. Dork, you haven't talked about Galactic Conquest or the campaign mode yet. Well, yeah, no shit, these videos have a structure to them and we haven't gotten there yet, chill the fuck out. First, we have to talk about the medals. That's right, Renegade Squadron has medals to unlock, just like Battlefront 2 did. Except, well, they don't do anything here, there's no rewards and in-game bonuses. Probably for the best, and hey, it was still fun seeing these achievement lights pop up now and then. Another extra to find in the main menu is the trailer for Force Unleashed on the PSP. Hmm, that does sound kind of fun. And playing some of the, the cool modes that we've built just for the PSP. So we've got Rule of the Galaxy, we've got Force Assassins, Order 66, and we send Wave after- Alright, see, now it's time to talk about the campaign. There's 11 missions in total, following the adventures of the secret Han Solo-led Renegade Squadron. They apparently, but not anymore due to the Disney canon, helped quite a lot during the events of the original trilogy. Starting at the glorious forest map of Yavin 4, going all the way to the masterful woodsy map of Endor, you'll be asked to blow up generators, repair turrets to take out vehicles, capture command posts, dogfight in space, rescue Admiral Akbar, heal him with back to tanks, retrieve important MacGuffins, steal a starship or two, and even... talk to an NPC and escort them to a door. What the fuck? What stood out to me was how well all of this worked with the customization system. In the tutorial for Battlefront 2, it felt like they were encouraging class switching on the fly to meet current needs, but they didn't really stick to landing with it. Here, though, the many objectives and potential equipment choices synergize perfectly. I can't get past how fun it was to use a stealth sabotage build, sneaking into their area and taking out structures from the inside. Even though the difficulty is on the lower side, it still manages to encourage playing around with other equipment to find the proper builds to take down certain tough objectives. I was throwing my head against a wall at some point, stubbornly assuming that the game would roll over eventually, allowing me to take the command post easy peasy. Well, I almost lost all my tickets this way, I had to switch it up and get the big guns out to wreak havoc. Something I noticed during the campaign was how climactic the final stands can sometimes be. In a normal Conquest game, each team has a certain number of reinforcements up top, and if they're down to the final command post, they're likely also very low on soldiers. Either you'll wipe out their entire team, the number up top hitting zero, thus granting you the victory, or there won't be many enemies left to fight you, so the final command post will be a breeze. 
Well, in campaign mode, they often have infinite reinforcements. This means capturing command posts one at a time makes the next one a little bit harder, and turns the final one into the ultimate war zone. No longer will their 16 units get spread out across the map, they're all spawning in at one location, ready to gang up on you the moment they teleport in. The finale on Endor was insane for this reason. I swear, we tried everything to capture that last command post, but nothing was working. They kept spawning in as fast as we could take them out. Thankfully, Han Solo, who apparently is bulletproof as the cutscenes showed earlier, managed to distract a whole grouping of stormtroopers away from me, even keeping them alive so more wouldn't spawn directly on top of me. It's quite fitting, honestly. Although it likely wasn't intentional by the CPU, this tactic literally is something Han Solo would do since he's done it before. If he didn't divert these guys away, I might still be there, hiding in their backyard back to droid room, slaughtering an endless number of stormtroopers. Poor guys. The cutscenes for the story all have that old, grainy PC FMV feel to them, which I love. The art was nice, and the voiceover was solid. Akbar was vital to the Alliance. The best battle tactician we had. We had to get him back. Only one man had access to the kind of information we wanted. Emperor Palpatine himself. But when that bounty hunter turned up, I knew there was trouble. Solo might not shoot first when it comes to bounty hunters. Me and the rest of the squadron, though. We had our own views on that. Nothing more to say on that front, but I liked it. Finally, there's Renegade Squadron's take on Galactic Conquest. It feels like a mix between the Battlefront 2 Galactic Conquest and the board game Risk. You get three phases per turn, purchase, move, and reinforce. Sound familiar? Oh, also, phase zero is the treasury phase where you gain credits. I'm so sorry, I forgot to add it in. Oh shit, oh shit, Dork's gonna see the me! The purchase phase lets you buy more troops in increments of 10 for any planet you control, up to a certain limit, and you can buy any upgrades available to you. There's not a whole lot to pick from, two logistics upgrades, two infantry, and two space tech. You can also purchase any leaders that are available during this time, too. In the second phase, you can move troops from one adjacent planet to another, as long as it isn't controlled by you. If it's unoccupied, you gain the planet under your control, and if it's the enemy, you launch a battle. You can choose how many units you want to send into the fight, but you have to keep at least 10 soldiers behind on the planet you're moving from, just like how in Risk, you have to leave at least one piece defending a territory. Because the enemy will likely have the same upgrades you do for infantry size, the attacking force will usually be at a disadvantage, such as 40 versus 50, 70 versus 80, or 90 versus 100. The third phase is reinforcement, exactly how it works in Risk. You can't buy anything or move to a new planet, but shuffle soldiers around that you already have, moving them from planet to planet. For instance, if you just attacked with as many troops as you could, leaving 10 behind on the planet they came from, on the reinforce phase, you can move troops from a planet nearby to bolster your numbers again. I feel like I'm muddying the waters here. It's just risk. Just picture risk. There are four quadrants on the play space, and if you control every planet within the borders, you can buy a bonus. In the purchase phase, you can gain the leader associated with that sector in exchange for a certain amount of credits. This doesn't unlock them for combat, but grants you their bonus. Admiral Akbar and Thrawn both allow two moves per turn, as long as it's taking place within their own sector. Organa and Tarkin are rivals, and thus both have the same buff, they cut the cost for tech upgrades and leaders in half. The Emperor and Mon Mothma, equally as powerful naturally, give you more credits per planet you own in their command sector each new turn. And finally, there's Han and Darth Vader, who are similar but don't share the exact same benefit. Vader sees your troops slowly regen health, and Han has your troops dealing more damage. Both allow heroes to be used more frequently, though. These commanders aren't permanent, by the way. If you lose a planet in one of their sectors, you'll lose out on that leader's bonus. If you want them back, you'll have to gain control of the sector again, and purchase them again. Kinda nuts if you ask me. No reason to buy Mon Mothma a second time, especially given how few upgrades there are in total. On that note, the upgrades are kinda neat, but there really isn't much here. The Logistics Path, which ups your total soldier count on a planet, is basically all anyone ever needs. You start at level 1 with a max of 50, then level 2 costs 300 credits to get 80 at a time, then 500 credits to get up to 100. I like the idea of the infantry tech, damage being reduced by 20% and unlocking heroes for ground and space battles, but it costs so goddamn much. 
500 and 1000 respectively. I'm not sure I want to even humor the space tech, unlocking a few more ships for space battles. Like, what on earth? Who cares? Space battles are so infrequent anyway, only taking place over the ruins of Alderaan. Hilarious that they count that as a planet, considering it's just rubble and space. Oh, also Kessel, too. And right before the home base invasions. The home bases can hold up to 150 troops, 50 more than what you're able to keep on every other planet, and 60 more than anyone could send over, since the max attacking force is 90. This means the only way an attacking force won't be outmatched is when their opponent is already on the ropes, unable to afford many reinforcements each new turn. The thing is, though, the troops you lose during the space battle above the planet don't affect how many soldiers you'll have in the ground section. Meaning as long as you win the fight, which is hard not to do when you have even 40 reinforcements, you're going to attack with your full force on the ground, regardless of how many ships you lost in space. What I'm saying is, why would anyone bother with the space tech upgrades if you can easily manage a space battle without the extra ships, and staying alive doesn't matter all that much, since the numbers don't carry over for the ground section of the home base attacks. Removing those two selections, since they're just sad, that leaves only four purchasable upgrades, and one is almost mandatory, the increase from 50 to 80 troops. I tried a game of Galactic Conquest where I refused to buy the logistics upgrades, instead buying everything else, but it just made the game more tedious. You can choose to simulate any given battle instead of playing it, and while I do think that's a fun choice, given you can essentially turn this into an actual game of Risk, being outnumbered almost always means a defeat. I think I only saw it happen once where my outmatched team won via simulation, and that was with the other upgrades actively helping out. This means if you want to have a chance, you'll be defending every planet every time, almost always at a heavy reinforcements disadvantage. It certainly does stretch the playtime out a lot, and it's not horrible, but it's just not very interesting. It's so cheap, too, so refusing to buy the 300 credit logistics upgrade is ultimately a pointless flex over the game that just drags things out. That said, the idea of only bringing in a handful of troops to face off against the enemy's larger reinforcement count is alluring, as is intentionally leaving a low number of soldiers to defend an outer planet. There's a degree of gambling involved, almost like you're betting on yourself. How good do you think you really are? I went 10 versus 70 on Ord Mantel, and I swear I could have done it, if I took into account the rocket launcher reload length, that is. This is what I was talking about earlier. This cost me an entire planet, since I bank on being able to throw my health packs whenever, and I royally messed up. Speaking of that, remember me talking about how a hero might cost you a victory? On Hoth, as the attacking forces, yes, for some reason Hoth was the home base for the Empire, I was severely outmatched, as is expected on the first home base assault. I think I could have soloed for the win, but because I bought the hero's upgrade, Luke Skywalker became available. Remember how bad he is with his little T-Rex arms? I knew I had a better chance with my chain gun build, but, of course, Luke was picked by an AI instead, and he ran directly towards an at, -AT. Fucker literally flushed my last 20 minutes down the toilet. Truth be told, it isn't all the CPU's fault. The timer for the hero means he's just a downright terrible selection for the end of a game. Maybe Darth Maul in Battlefront 2 could do it, but the Jedi and Sith and Renegade Squadron couldn't take down a fly, so they aren't exactly about to go 50 and 1 or something. Something else kind of fun about the reinforcements mechanic is the possibility of really short battles. 10 troops versus 20 takes about 3 minutes. The home base assaults with space and ground might take up to a half hour, a normal 70 versus 80 is about 10 minutes or so, and smaller scuffles could be over in a heartbeat. This is something I would have liked to see in the Battlefront 2 version, maybe with my idea of having two maps for each planet, one for small and one for large battles. As much fun as Renegade Squadron's Galactic Conquest can be for a few hours, it doesn't have the progression or depth of Battlefront 2. I mean, I don't think any of these interpretations of the game mode are especially deep or anything, but the lack of upgrade choices really hurts this version. I would have thought the many equipment options would be a perfect fit for this. You could purchase entire classes in Battlefront 2, so why not allow players to purchase guns for their armies in Renegade Squadron? Sure, there's a lot here, but I think making you and your squadmates more powerful and more versatile, little by little, would have been pretty dang satisfying. Even if you don't particularly like using the equipment yourself, seeing your squadmates wield them has to make you feel a bit proud. At least, that's how I felt with the classes I didn't care about in Battlefront 2. All in all, I appreciate Galactic Conquest's inclusion, and can respect them trying new things with it, 
especially considering how toned down the space battles were by comparison to the previous entry, but at the same time, it's nothing that'll keep you coming back to the game. You can't even do it with clones and droids, it's only Rebels and Empire for some reason. Just not quite enough here. Battlefront Renegade Squadron was a surprise, to be sure. The campaign is a bit short, there's not much replayability with Galactic Conquest, the Jedi and Sith lightsaber users control really strangely, and there's a general feeling of clunkiness that doesn't really ever go away. However, there's quite a lot here that balances those quibbles out. The new game mode in Hero Capture the Flag is great, the added heroes are nice to see, the new maps make the game feel distinct visually, and the new equipment choices, along with the freely customizable loadout, provide a lot of fun mix-and-matching experimentation. Even the base gameplay, the simple but solid loop of holding R to target the next foe, only to mow them down, it's cathartic in a way. This game feels like a Star Wars Battlefront game, and even though you might move on after a week or two, it's worth the time you'll spend with it. If you're a fan of the series anyway. Hopefully this will show up on the PlayStation Classics catalog soon, given the Battlefront resurgence we're kind of having with the two classic games. I imagine a lot of people will enjoy finally getting to experience some of these new heroes, weapons, and maps. Except Boz Pity, that one sucks. Thanks for watching, folks. I'm currently working on quite a few videos, one in particular being especially long, but I wanted to get this one out before the new Battlefront remasters launched. Hopefully I hit that deadline, we'll see. I'm a dad now, by the way, so yeah, having a baby is slowing down the channel a bit, but it's totally worth it. My daughter is the cutest little shit ever. Alright, that's enough out of me. Don't forget to tip your waiters and watch those wrist rockets.